What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is author and professor of political economy at the University of Cambridge, Helen Thompson. Helen's current research concentrates on the political economy of energy and the long history of the democratic, economic, and geopolitical disruptions of the 21st century, which she explores magisterially in her new book, Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century. For those of us who grew up in the 1980s and 1990s, the nature of the world as we knew it to be only seemed to be getting better and better. The price of energy and the cost of capital kept getting cheaper, the world kept getting safer and more interconnected, and liberal democracy and free market capitalism were seen as inevitable outcomes of the end of history. Today, all of that feels like it was almost a dream. The last two decades, to quote my guest, Helen Thompson, have brought a powerful tide of geopolitical, economic, and democratic shocks onto the world. Their fallout has led central banks to create over $25 trillion of new money, brought about a new age of geopolitical competition, destabilized the Middle East, ruptured the European Union, and exposed old political fault lines right here in the United States. Fault lines that seem to challenge even those of the tumultuous 1960s and 1970s, when the specter of nuclear war and the trauma of violent riots and political assassinations cast a long shadow over the future of the Republic. Today's conversation endeavors to draw a line of continuity between those turbulent years and the present political moment, as we try and imagine how a future situated in the long arc of human history with all its political challenges, economic imperatives, and destructive wars might unfold. It recounts three histories one about geopolitics, one about the world economy, and another about Western democracies, and explains how, in the years of political disorder prior to the pandemic, the disruption in each became part of one big story, much of which originates in the problems generated by fossil fuel energies and our efforts to control them. And it explains why, as the green transition takes place, the long-standing predicaments that energy invariably shapes will remain firmly in place. As most of you already know, Hidden Forces is listener supported. I don't rely on advertisers or commercial sponsors. So the second hour of today's episode with Helen is available exclusively to premium subscribers. You can access that part of the conversation as well as the transcripts and intelligence reports to each episode by visiting our website at hiddenforces.io. Selecting the episode you're interested in listening to and clicking on the premium extras where you can then sign up to one of our premium content tiers. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode with my guest, the absolutely brilliant Helen Thompson. Helen Thompson, welcome to Hidden Forces. It's a pleasure to be here, Dimitri. The pleasure is all mine, Helen. I downloaded your audiobook months ago, like right when the book came out, a listener had messaged me about it. And I started listening to it. And this is a rare occurrence because usually if I, the only time I stop listening to a book is if I don't like it. But in your case, I started listening to it and I was like, this book is amazing. I need to have the bandwidth to really properly take it in. And the way I do my research for this podcast is that I kind of go down rabbit holes in certain areas and I focus on them very deliberately. And I just wasn't focused on this particular kind of nexus, even though it's so much like what we've talked about on this podcast for over the last five plus years. So we're going to get into that. But before we do any of that, I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about yourself and what, I guess, evolution of interests led you to have the career that you have today. Okay. Uh, well, I've been in the Department of Politics and International Studies in Cambridge since 1994 or at least I've been in that space. It's been in different institutional formulations. I've always been interested in political economy, 
So basically, you know, the politics of how the world economy works. But I've also been in a, a place in Cambridge where there's lots of people interested in the history of political thought and generally people who want to think about politics in relation, if you like, to long historical time. So I suppose what happened to me in some sense was that over my time in Cambridge, I sort of absorbed something of that way of thinking and took it into what I brought to proceedings, which initially was, I think, an understanding of international monetary politics in the 80s and 90s, particularly as it pertained to Europe. And actually, very originally, in terms of my PhD, as it pertained to Britain and the European monetary system. And I became increasingly interested in the 2000s in the long historical relationship between international capital flows and democratic politics. And then I would say that the crash, the 2008 crash, really began to upend my thinking about a number of things. Well, I I suppose it, it got me back interested in again in American politics which is what I've been interested in as an undergraduate, actually. And then I began to see that there was a very strong relationship between the monetary fallout of the crash and what was going on in oil markets, and particularly the shale oil boom. So I hadn't actually started off with any particular interest in energy. I just started to pay attention to it, really, I'd say, in the mid-2000s, when I was very aware the price of oil was rising as sharply as it was. And it kind of in, you know, piqued my interest because you know, I'm a child of the 70s. I remember the oil price shocks and the inflationary consequences of them, or at least I came to understand the inflationary consequences of them. And so it piqued my interest that there seemed to be this huge oil price increase going on without there being the same kind of inflationary ramifications that there were in the, the 70s. But I just kind of had that as a sort of like just a bit of thing that I sort of piece of information, if you like, that I've absorbed. It was when I started to see the relationship between the monetary fallout of the crash and the shale oil boom. That's what really got me going, refocused my interest really around energy and oil in particular. And you can't spend very little much time, I should say, thinking about oil, even in its macroeconomic form, without pretty quickly getting to geopolitics. So then in some sense, I sort of spent the middle part of the 2010s trying to teach myself how to think geopolitically. And if you put all the different bits of that story together, in some sense, that's how we get to my approach in disorder. Okay, so let's see if we can try to either summarize or ease people into what the book is about, because you kind of touched on all the different forces, so to speak, that you cover in the book. Politics and nationalism is one of those threads, and there's a fascinating discussion to have there. And the politics of economics and economic choices and monetary policy choices, which are ultimately political. I mean, I love this also, which is that it is very much political economy. It isn't economics extracted from the political realm. It very much situates economics within political choices. And there's also the geopolitics of energy, which again, factors prominently in your book. So maybe you can describe for us what the book is about and what, if you could even sort of put it this way, what the thesis is that you have tried to put forward in it. Well... I think the fundamental thing that I wanted to do when I started writing the book was to give a long history to the shocks of the 2010s. And I didn't think of those shocks as only being about Brexit and Trump, which is obviously the most obvious ones from 2016. I had a a strong sense that, you know, if you like, geopolitical plates were turning And if you wanted to put an event onto that sense, it was something else that happened in 2016. It was the failed Turkish coup. And I had a maybe initially not much more than an intuition, but quickly became a set of thoughts that actually all these things weren't disconnected with each other, that there were some bigger forces at work that could explain in some sense how 
the disruption in the middle of the 2010s moved around from country to country and sphere to sphere. And because by that point I had written a short book about oil and was thinking quite, or trying anyway, to think quite hard about both the macroeconomic consequences of the oil problem and the geopolitical consequences of the oil problem, I also started from a sense that energy might well be, and oil in particular, might well be a connecting thread. Not that it would be a sufficient explanation of any of this, but that it might be a necessary part of the explanation about why the second half of the 2010s in particular turned out to be as disruptive as they um, were. Again, I didn't want to be energy determinist about it. I think if I'd been an energy determinist about it, I wouldn't have written the the third part of the book, the the history of, of essentially democratic politics in Western countries, not least, obviously, the question, as you said already, Dimitri, in relation to nationhood. And so what I wanted to do then was to find a way um, of presenting that disruption of the 2010s in a way that imposed some kind of analytical structure onto it without losing the complexity of the different things that were going on. And that's why I decided on this three-part structure to the book, essentially, to write three different histories with different timelines, actually, and then try in the conclusion to put them back together again as an explanation of the 2010s shocks. And the complications, I would then say, that arose from doing that, well, there were various analytical complications, but the events complications were first the pandemic, um, which happened, started when I was in the middle of me writing the book, and I had to find a way of bringing that into it. And then the fact that as I was starting writing the book, so at, which was a, so actually writing, which is the summer of 2019, you know, it became clear to me that something pretty significant was happening on the energy transition front, because that was the second part of that year was when there were a whole series of West, or there was a series of Western governments that made their net zero 2050 commitments. You see the rise of ESG investing really taking off that year. And so that forced me into trying to connect the energy story that I wanted to tell about the past to an accelerating energy story about the the future. So whilst I started off with a book that was trying to offer a thesis really about the 2010s from a long durée, if you like, perspective, I ended up writing a book that tried to do that plus tried to give almost like some a history to the future where energy was concerned and where the energy transition was concerned. Yeah, it's incredible how broad you ranged in this book. It truly is. And your competence in it is formidable. I mean, I, one of the ways that I judge books, the credibility of authors, as I'm sure many people do, is I judge it based on the things that I know about. And in anything that I know about that you've written about, I'm just so impressed because you cover such a wide range. Your, your ability to speak authoritatively about the history of monetary policy, everything from the euro dollar market to, I mean, it's amazing. So let's actually try and do this because again, you range so broadly, we could sit here for 12 hours and still not finish, really get through all the questions I could possibly ask you. Let's begin with the beginning. Because again, you, you mentioned 2016, and I don't really know where you want to draw the beginning because in, in many ways in the book, you do say that the beginning of where we find ourselves today really started in the 1970s. But the book is also, it goes all the way back to the 19th century in talking about the significance of oil and its central place and fossil fuels, their central place really in the development of modernity. So I'm going to let you decide where you want to begin this story to help us understand the present political moment. Well, I think that there are at least two ways of doing this. And I would say in a way I've got a thesis that there's a third way of doing it, which would be to say that 2005 is a pretty significant year in which a lot changes. I think the advantage of going right back to the beginning, which I'm taking to be the beginning of the oil story. So that's sort of the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the, the 20th century is, is that I think that there's something actually quite simplifying about that. 
because if we can start with the fact that at the beginning of the 20th century, there were two significant oil producers in the world, the United States and Russia, that the 19th century had been the century of West European imperial powers, obviously, particularly Britain. And you had a rising, obviously, Germany at that point as well. And I think that you can make a great deal of sense of the what happened thereafter in the 20th century from that starting place so that you know, the 20th century geopolitically would be long to the United States and Russia, well, Russia in the form of the, the Soviet Union and Britain would be uh, quite rapidly in the end uh, declining imperial power. And what we see, I think, and we see the consequences of this very evident in what's going on in Europe today during the war is that this is the beginning of a, of a really serious problem for European countries of foreign energy dependency, foreign oil dependency and becomes foreign gas dependency. That's very different than what it was like for the most successful European countries in the 19th century, particularly Britain and Germany, which had an abundant supply of coal. And that's the context in which Britain was the first country to industrialize. And it's pretty central to Germany's rise as a, a unified state. But as oil became more important, to begin with, it was really as an energy source for the military um, power. And then mattered increasingly um, economically as the century went on, that large countries that or relatively large countries anyway, that didn't have a domestic supply, had a set of predicaments, deep and acute predicaments that they pretty much permanently had to um, manage. And different European countries at different times went about this problem in different ways in the first half of the 20th century. They tried to acquire empires in the Middle East, Britain and France ultimately more successfully than anybody else. Germany, which was shut out of the Middle East, despite the efforts it had made to acquire a position there prior to the, the First World War, at least, or at least uh, acquire drilling rights for exploration rights for its companies there, ended up under the Nazis, turning towards conquest of resource-rich, oil-rich Russia, Soviet Union, in order to try to deal with its problems. And then in the post-Second World War, the way in which European countries can deal with these problems is constrained by, very strongly constrained by American power. And it's when Eisenhower refuses to let Britain act as the imperial power looking after West European oil interests in the Middle East during the Suez Crisis in, in 1956, that we see a turn back towards Russian oil, Soviet oil, um, as it then was. And then that moves into a, a gas relationship that is central, was central to Ostpolitik, to the essentially the detente between West Germany and the, the Soviet Union from the um, early 1970s. And then that energy relationship continued into the post-Cold War world. So I don't think it's possible to understand any of the really significant geopolitical junctures in the 20th century without understanding the role that oil played in that. And particularly in terms of what we've just been talking about anyway, the particular problems that European countries had. Were the 1980s and 1990s an interregnum to this mm. period? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's two ways of looking at this. If we look at it from the large oil consuming countries side, and I would at this point include the United States in this because the... United States' as domestic oil production had peaked in 1970 and wouldn't reach that height again until the shale oil boom in the in the 2010s. So in a number of ways, the United States ended up having some of the same problems as European um, countries from 1970 onwards, even though it remained a significant oil producer. If we look at the 80s and 90s from their point of view, what we can see is a period of significantly lower oil prices for the most part, particularly obviously compared to the 1970s. So that meant that there was a macroeconomic interlude from the problems of oil-driven inflation in the 1970s. But there was also, I think, something of a interlude in the Middle East. Not that the Middle East didn't cause quite a number of problems. Think, for instance, of the Iran-Iraq war, and the way in which the United States had to kind of use Iraq during the that war as an anti-Iranian force. 
but it wasn't comparable to the difficulties that had been caused in the 70s and it wasn't comparable to the difficulties that would be caused from the second Iraq war you know onwards in in 2000 from 2003 the thing that did happen in the 80s where oil was a pretty significant part of the story i think geopolitically was what happened to the soviet union and that isn't to say that the soviet union didn't have many problems both economically and in terms of maintaining its empire in Eastern Europe. But if you look at the the sequence of events that led to the rapid dissolution, first of Soviet rule in Eastern Europe, and then the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself, then the oil price crash of the middle of the 1980s from 1986 is pretty important to that because it meant that Soviet export revenues collapsed was the only export revenues the Soviet Union really had was from energy exports to Western Europe. And because since the 70s, the Soviets had been using those energy export revenues in order to finance food imports, agricultural imports, that meant that a food crisis ensued from its energy problems or its export, energy export problems that created a financial dependency on borrowing from like Western governments, Western banks. And all that played a not insignificant part, I think, in which, at least in the speed at which the Soviet Union dissolved in the in the latter part of the, the 1980s. Was this and it's very during notable. a period where the United States was exporting more wheat to the Soviet Union? Yeah. I mean, the turn in the 70s where the, the Soviets go both ways in the senses is that the energy export revenue becomes significantly more important. I mean, that's both because of the gas relationship that's building up with West European countries, but also because of the oil price hikes of the 1970s. And at that point, the Soviet Union is actually the largest oil producer in in the world. When, when US production peaks in 1970, it's actually the Soviet Union that takes over as the largest producer and not initially Saudi Arabia. So the Soviets benefiting from extra export revenue, think that they can import significant quantities of food, including wheat from the United States, that they have the revenues to pay for it. It's very interesting thinking about these interdependencies. You know, I mean, when I had studied US-Soviet relations, the selling wheat to the Russians on the part of the Americans was a, a geopolitical, geostrategic decision or it certainly factored in mm. because it gave the United States a level of leverage. And we see this now too. We see this attempt by countries, and, and I look forward to getting to this conversation by Ukraine because this is ultimately where it's going. But we see this now where countries are scrambling for leverage. And right now, the Russians have a tremendous amount of leverage because of the dependency of European states on Russian gas in particular, but Russian oil and gas. So Let's actually go back to the 1970s here because I want to try and take some lessons from the 1970s. Because this is one of those decades where now it's top of mind. It's something that we've talked about on the show for years. But even, even during the periods in which we've talked about it, I've always been conscious of the fact that I might be caricaturing it or using it to fit some of my own assumptions or biases about where the world may be going. What is the legacy of the 1970s, its impact, in other words, on both geopolitics, which we've kind of touched on, mm. and on politics? How did it undermine or change the social contract that existed in Western economies and political societies? Well, I think there's several things here. If we just take the geopolitics quickly, I would say that the thing that really changes is that there's a a shift in the balance of power in favour of oil producing countries and particularly in the Middle East. And that is in part a function of the fact that by the end of the decade, most of the, the big oil firms that are producing oil out of the Middle East are being done by state-owned companies that the Seven Sisters, as they were called, you know, the Western oil majors, have basically lost their um, position there. They by the end of the 1960s. Is, well, is no, the by the end of the 70s. 70s. By the end of the by the end of the the 70s. So that means that the consequences of Britain having to withdraw militarily from the Middle East because it's no longer in a position to maintain what remains of its empire there, and the fact that the United States 
I think largely because of the Vietnam War, isn't in a position militarily to replace Britain as the Western power in the Middle East, means that Western governments become dependent upon Middle Eastern, two Middle Eastern governments in the first part of the decade, Saudi Arabia and Iran. And then with the Iranian revolution, one of those is lost. And I think that part of the story then about what happens to the geopolitics of the Middle East is the way in which successive administrations in in Washington have to manage that predicament. And they get to the point in 1990 when they're willing to use military power directly in the Middle East after Saddam's invasion um, of Kuwait. But they're still quite nervous about a really significant military commitment there. It's not that there's none, but it's quite problematic what they end up doing from their point of view. And then I think what you see from the second Iraq war is an attempt actually to say, okay, no, we're going to use our military power to try to reshape the Middle East in ways that are conducive to Western energy interests. And as we know, that runs into all kinds of difficulties. So I would say that geopolitically, where energy is concerned anyway, the fallout of the 70s is to turn the Middle East into a different kind of problem for Western governments. It's not that it's not been an issue before, but really the British have acted as an imperial power there in ways that haven't always worked. You know, Exhibit A obviously being the the Suez um, crisis because Eisenhower wouldn't let them. But there's still been some sort of coherence to the relationship between a Western power being militarily there and Western energy interests in the Middle East. And that just, it disappears from the, the 1970s. And the Americans have to keep trying to find ways to try and deal with that problem. Meanwhile, if if we then look into the 70s in terms of like domestic economies and democratic politics, I think we can see several different things that I would bring out. The first of them is that as the world financially liberalises again, or at least as the the richer parts of the world financially liberalise again, this creates a set of new constraints on democratic politics. They're not only constraints because it's possible for governments to borrow much more money in international capital markets than they'd previously done. But a whole set of policies that they'd used to try both to grow their economies and to stabilise their democracies during the post-war era just work less well in a more internationalised world economy. And that starts to have increasing effects over time, including, I would ultimately say, ultimately, on what kind of taxes can be successfully um, levied and on and on whom. And then the inflationary problems of the 1970s, as we know, lead to a quite significant monetary effort to deal with inflation that in its fallout brings significantly higher levels of unemployment across most Western economies and various bits of anti-trade union legislation that's passed in various Western countries makes it, well, it just weakens the bargaining position of organised labour very considerably. And as that's happening at the same time as we're beginning to see the start of China's integration into the world economy, and the possibilities that has in terms of outsourcing manufacturing production from Western economies to China, something that's not particularly going to come into having lots of obvious consequences, I think, until the 2000s. But we've got another force at work that is actually diminishing Labour's political influence in both the national economy and in the democratic politics of that, the democratic politics of that country. Now, the lesson that's taken out of of that inflation experience of the 70s is, is, oh, what we need are independent central banks. We need independent central banks then that will have, you know, inflation targets that they're, you know, very determined and um, to stick to. I think, though, that that's a kind of misreading of what happened in the 70s in the sense that it's not obvious that the lesson you should take out of the 70s is, well, we had inflationary problems because we had democratic, foolish democratic pol- politicians who took too many um, inflationary risks, and therefore we must take monetary authority away from them and give it 
give it to central banks. I think that that misses the role, going back to what we talked about earlier, the role that oil prices coming down from about 1981 onwards, but certainly very much so from the middle of the decade, played in ending the inflationary problems of the the 1970s. So in some sense, like organised labour got the blame for what happened in the 1970s where inflation's concerned. And I don't think that organised labour was the cause of the inflationary problems. It was a response to the inflationary, the demands and trade unions response to the inflationary problems, but the inflationary problems were generated on the oil side. Okay, so, so many things to pull from this. One, I just want to summarize something that you said or clarify it. In terms of the Middle East, what you're saying is that as a result of the withdrawal of the British and the French, combined with the fact that the United States now became increasingly dependent on Middle Eastern fuel itself, the Middle East became both more important and more complicated to control. Would you agree with that? And this explains yeah. so much of the geopolitics of, of the Middle East in the 1980s. Yeah. And, and what you see as well then by the end of the decade, a problem that is going to you know continue into the 2000s and actually to some extent continues to this day, is as you have regimes in the Middle East that become hostile to the United States in particular, you have regimes um, that are sanctioned and these oil producing regimes. So first of all, starting with Iran, you know, the end of the 1970s. And then by the time you've got to the early 2000s, when you know, the Bush White House is very aware that this is a problem, is you've got Iran under sanctions about its oil exports. You've got Iraq under sanctions about its oil exports. You've got Libya under sanctions about its oil um, exports. And in a world in which people are starting to worry about the supply of oil, having sanctions on regimes in the Middle East is a problem on top of the ability of OPEC to control the price, or at least to try to control the price, mm -hmm. but at least moderately successfully. There was a need to hit the reset button on the geopolitics of the region. Let me ask you this. As a result of the Vietnam War and the backlash against foreign intervention domestically within the United States and also abroad, did the United States, and I guess the Brits as well, and the French, to the extent they were involved, did they rely more on covert action in the Middle East as a result of the, the war in Vietnam? No, I think that covert action, covert action in the Middle East had actually been there right since the beginning. I mean, I think you, you can see it actually going back to a pipeline issue in Syria in the immediate years after the, the, the Second World War. You can see it in terms of the coup in Iran against Mossadegh in 1953. I mean, there's certainly a continuation of it into the 80s. But I, I don't think that it's simply a case that the new juncture, if you like, from the 70s onwards really pushes it more into the covert realm. I think the covert realm was always there. I mean, it, there may be some increase. I haven't quite thought about that before, but I, I think that the, there was always something that, was, that involved the use of covert power uh, in the Middle East. I bring this up because, and I don't want to dwell on it too much right now because we'll, we might touch on it later. I bring it up because you mentioned 2016 and the Turkish coup mm. and the claims on the part of Erdogan that the US was involved. It wasn't just mm. the, the Gulenists, it was also the United States. And this is a common theme, which is that there are many nations in the Middle East and elsewhere that sort of erect this, this US boogeyman. And there's mm. no doubt that the United States has engaged in covert actions, but it's hard to know exactly what is true and what isn't true there. That's why I was kind of asking to just dig into it a little bit, but we'll touch on it later when we when we get to 2016. There are a few other things I want to pull out. One is this dynamic between labor and capital, which existed in the 1970s in, in terms of a transition. By the end of the decade, capital, in a sense, had sort of taken the, the upper hand. And that's not the case today. Capital still has the upper hand. In other words, we don't have the labor capital dynamics that we had then. And with respect to labor and your point about demand pull versus um, cost push inflation, have scholars of this period come to any confident determination around what the primary drivers of the inflation were? And this is topical because Jay Powell recently mm -hmm. came out and said, we're just something like we understand. I think he said, we understand better how little we understand about the causes of inflation. So I guess there are two questions there. One is, how well do we understand what the drivers were? And why, after so many decades, mm 
our central bankers who are, have t- hundreds of PhDs at the institutions in a position where one, they're expected to manage inflation, and two, they can tell us that they don't understand it? These are quite hard questions. I think that there's some consensus about the 1970s about energy's centrality to it. I say only some because obviously it was an article of faith of monetarist economists that inflation is only a monetary phenomenon and that it's not caused by energy costs. I think that still people who would make that argument now, I think that it's hard to to think that at the very least significant qualifications have got to be made to it and uh, a significant acknowledgement of the, the, the place that oil prices played. And the fact that you, know, you can see a pretty clear correlation or you know, parallel lines, let's just put it that way, between what happens to inflation and then what happens to oil prices in terms of what happens in the 80s when the inflation problems under control. Now, that isn't to say that the monetary policies that were pursued and the extremely high interest rates that were pursued didn't have a consequence. They clearly did, not least because they were you know, like very destructive where employment was concerned and growth was concerned. I think that now it's partly an issue because which I suppose was true in the 70s too, in lots of ways, or at least in a number of ways, the account that one gives of inflation has political implications. So if you want to attack Biden's stimulus, you know, in the United States, you know, like during the pandemic, then it's quite convenient, if you like, to say that actually, look, this is the cause of the inflation problem. That Just like States. attacking labor unions in the 1970s, yeah, for example. Yeah, it was. I think the difficulty is, if you look at now, is that that kind of stimulus wasn't there in you know European countries on the same scale, and then very clearly, European countries have got an inflation problem too. Uh, and the thing that this has got in common are high energy prices. I mean, you still have got to put some caveats in on the energy explanation of it all. In this sense, in that. You know, Japan um, doesn't seem to have an inflation problem in the same way. I mean, I think it's also true energy prices are more directly or indirectly perhaps controlled there. So I would say it's quite complicated. There's political implications to any position that anybody takes on this. And it's all, in my view anyway, compounded by the fact that much of the language of the economics profession itself or much of not just the language, but the basis of analysis of much of the economic profession doesn't really engage with energy questions. It's not really set up to engage with energy questions. And I think that that makes it harder then to form really clear judgments using the economic data as they come to us from economists (laughs) as to what causally is going on. So I I lean towards energy explanations, but I can see that that's not always sufficient. Yeah, I think also another thing that's interesting to consider here is the issue of consent. Mm -hmm. Because after the 1970s, getting that consent became more complicated. Not just because of foreign adventures in the Middle East, but again, because of interest group politics in the United States and the role of international capital flows and the way in which economies became more interdependent. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. And I'm also curious because this ties in directly to monetary regimes, what the relationship is between energy regimes and energy abundance versus energy deficits and the way in which monetary policy is managed. I mean, this ties directly to the US dollar and the US dollar's role as a reserve currency and its ability to function in a world of high energy prices. But you could take that however you like. Mm. Well, I think that's what what's interesting about the middle of the 2000s. I think this is quite a, a revealing sort of moment because from 2004, but more so from like 2005, we start to see this really quite sharp rise in oil prices that will ultimately culminate in 
oil prices at around $150 a barrel, so higher than it ever been before or since in the middle of 2008. And you see central bankers, certainly at the Fed, um, the ECB, the Bank of England, if you go through the minutes of those years, worrying about rising oil prices. They don't all do it at the same time. And at a certain point when oil prices are still going up, the Fed was worrying more about recession than it is about the oil prices going the inflation, up. The energy-driven inflation. Yeah. And what the way in which that they frame it, or the predominantly anyway, certainly with the Fed frames it, is they're worried about the secondary effects of it. So actually there's an acknowledgement that there's not much that in fact it's really nothing that they can do directly with monetary policy in the face of energy driven inflation. But they're constantly looking out for whether it's having effect on wage bargaining, whether you're seeing labor demand higher wages to compensate. If it's impacting inflation expectations, another way of saying yeah. that as well. Inflation expectations and then inf- and, and then impacting behavior. Because that's, in a sense, I think the story the, that- The economic out- model of monetary economists. Yeah, this is what they got. That, that's the story that they got out of the 1970s. You can see Mervyn King, when he was the governor at the Bank of England, going a little bit further than that. He gave a speech in 2005 in which he said nice was over, the years of nice were over, and he meant by that non-inflationary, continuous economic growth, and he he put rising oil prices, and, and not just accidentally rising oil prices, but systematically rising oil price, prices as the explanation for that. And Trichet, um, John Clark Trichet at the ECB, gave a, a not dissimilar sort of set of remarks, I think it was in 2008, in which he basically said, that um, Western countries would have to get used to, to the fact that there'd been a shift in the balance of power in favour of commodity exporters, which is again is a kind of like 1970s argument. I think the interesting thing about that phase was that the rising oil prices and extraordinarily sharp rises in oil prices once we get into late 2007 and 2008, they didn't really translate into an obvious inflationary crisis. And I think that was because there were other disinflationary forces at work in the world economy at the same time, particularly those that were coming from China. And that that meant that actually the implications of what was going on economically with oil in the middle of the 2000s kind of not entirely passed people by because you can see it in the kind of concerns that King and Trichet had, but it didn't get dwelt upon. And then when the crash came, the whole framing of those years became around what had gone on with banks and it as a banking crisis. And the fact that there were, as I see it, like parallel crises going on in, in 2008 rather disappeared out of consciousness of people doing economic commentary. If we then skip on to 2011, when oil prices go back above two, sorry, $100 um, a barrel again, what's interesting this time is that the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England decide to tough it out, even though actually it does produce, you know, not insignificant inflation. It goes above 5% in, in Britain, which is not obviously as high as it is now, but you know, it was quite striking for the time. The European Central Bank, by contrast, while Trichet is still in charge, says that, that they've got to stick to their mandate for price stability, raises raised interest rates twice in 2011 in response to that spike in oil prices and the inflationary consequences of that. But I think that that showed on the Fed and the Bank of England side a sense of, well, we're not seeing that change in inflation expectations, particularly from trade unions, certainly in terms of trade unions making a response to those inflation expectations in terms of demanding higher wages. So we don't need to act. What's interesting this time round is that the inflation levels are being quite a lot higher, as we know, than they were in the 2011 period. And the great advantage of the on the monetary side of the high oil prices between 2011 and 2014 was that they were quite steady. It was quite unusual in that respect of having three years of steadily high prices rather than having high prices coming from surges. So I think that what we're seeing this time round is it's a harder problem both because the levels of inflation are higher, but I would say perhaps also because the pandemic then created labor shortage issues at least, and it's got more patats of a potential for rising wage demands this time than was the case 
either in 2011 or 2007, first half of 2008. So two questions. One, this is very short because we could turn it into a gigantic, <laughs> a gigantic answer if we decided to, but I'm curious to know whether you think it would have been feasible for the United States not to have invaded Iraq or tried to remake the Middle East, if in other words, the status quo could have continued indefinitely? That's just one question. Mm. Actually, go ahead and answer that, and then I'll, I'll ask you my second yeah. question. I mean, I think my position on, on this is that if one understands it in oil terms, it is possible to understand what the Bush administration thought it was doing and going to war in Iraq. That doesn't mean that I think that it was justified. It just means I think you can construct a coherent motive for it, which was that they needed an Iraq that wasn't under sanctions, preferably from their point of view, one um, where Western oil companies could be the players in partnership with the a new Iraqi government and Iraq will be able to produce a lot more oil than it had done in the Saddam years, either the pre-sanctioned Saddam years or the sanctioned Saddam years. I think you can see that. I think the difficulty from the in the conception of, of the whole thing was as well, did the United States have anything remotely like the military power that was going to be capable of producing the outcome that it wanted in Iraq. And I don't mean by that whether it could topple Saddam Hussein, but whether it could actually construct a, use its military power to then construct a stable, peaceful Iraq thereafter. And could it do so in a way that wasn't actually going to strengthen Iranian influence in the um, region, which is obviously one of the geopolitical you know, byproducts of the, of the war. And that's where I think that it's quite a lot harder to, to understand why there was the optimism that there was that this was in practice a viable strategy for dealing with the problem. Now, in the end, I would say, actually, the compensation for the failure of the Iraq war in oil terms was the shale oil boom, in that actually it turned out that you didn't actually need Iraq, for the 2010s anyway, the future might be a bit different, you didn't actually need Iraq to be producing you know, 12 million barrels a day as the Iraqi government was promising it was going to by 2009 that the United States itself could hugely increase its oil production more rapidly than any country's probably ever done before. So in that sense, if the oil premise of the Iraq war was we need to get more oil out of the Middle East and Iraq's the best bet because it's got lots of untapped potential that we're having geopolitically to constrain at the moment, actually there was, or there turned out to be a, a domestic remedy for that. Now, that was a domestic remedy that required a particular monetary and financial environment that was inadvertently supplied by the crash. Um, you know, the zero interest rate, quantitative easing, um, monetary environment is the one in which the shale oil boom was able to take off because it was offering returns to higher returns to investors who didn't have to care too much about whether this production was profitable in the short term anyway. So later outcomes suggest that the Iraq war even in these terms I'm constructing for it, wasn't actually necessary. Now, at the same time, how do you then go back and say, okay, they could have all foreseen the shale boom, you know, like in the 2000, in the thing. And that isn't because shale technology wasn't around. It was. Shale had been around a long time. It was a question about whether it was financially possible, financially viable to extract oil by hydraulic fracturing. Mm. So a few things come up here that I want to highlight. One, the energy transition, which is that you begin to see how the energy transition is not just about concerns over the climate. It's also very much about deep concerns around energy security mm -hmm. and this constant need to find reliable sources of energy, especially in light of the fact that the Middle East had become increasingly ungovernable as a result in, in large part of foreign interventions and adventures. The Iraq war for me is a fascinating part of this history because in so many ways, it touches on the peak complexity of trying to manage this vital resource and all the side effects that it caused. And, and it speaks directly to this issue, which I want to 
ask about you next in this last question before we move it to the premium part of our conversation, Helen, which has to do with credibility. Credibility of the governing institutions and elite structures of society. Because I think the challenge with the Iraq war, irrespective of whether or not the Americans could have been able to find a way, in other words, irrespective of whether or not it was the invasion itself that was destined to fail or if the plan was ill-conceived for the occupation, irrespective, the invasion in so many ways struck at the heart of the presumptions about the rules-based liberal order that the United States had constructed, that it led, and that it claimed to live by. And that hypocrisy stung. It stung across the world. It stung both in the Middle East, but it also stung in Europe and in the United States. And it stung in some ways, particularly hypocritically in Europe, because the Europeans were able to operate under the luxury of offloading their security to the United States for so many years. So this issue of credibility and the consent of a governor is something I want to talk about in the second part of our conversation. Before we do, I have one last question to sort of tie up this historical exploration, which has to do again with consent. And we talked a little bit about that with respect to the 1970s and the role that the liberation of capital played in the United States and the way in which in many ways I feel like American politics became more transactional as a result of that. And the EU treaties in Europe mm -hmm. specifically, because what the Europeans have been through for Americans who haven't really studied the transformation of Europe as a result of the, of the expansion of the European Union, the development of European Monetary Union, I don't think they can really appreciate what an enormous feat of technocracy that has been and the challenges, the fundamental challenges it has created for democracy and for the consent of the governed in Europe and how in many ways so much of that is coming home to roost in, in such specific ways. So talk to me a little bit about that, about the technocracy, the European treaties, and how all that folds into this notion of consent so that we can get into the implications of all of that as part of the second part of our conversation. Yeah, I think that what you can see, in one sense, I think one should start in 1991 with like the Maastricht Treaty, because that was the treaty that created the monetary union which brought into play a very specific set of technocratic versus technocracy versus democracy issues but most it was also important because of the fact that it introduced eu law into new policy areas and then extended qualified majority voting so the end of the national member state veto beyond issues to do with the completion of the the single market. Having said that, I think you can go back to the 70s and see some of these issues play out around the accession of the first three additional states to join the then European community, Ireland, Denmark, and Britain. And the fact that Britain joined without there being a referendum on the treaty of accession and then ended up having a referendum anyway a, a few years later about like whether to leave. So there is a prehistory to this, but I think the Maastricht is a a pretty important, perhaps the decisive juncture in this respect. And it's also the beginning of a set of treaties that run all the way through to the Lisbon Treaty that was finally ratified in 2009. And along the way, one of those treaties had to be dropped, the Constitutional Treaty, after French and Dutch voters had voted that treaty down, although it was the Constitutional Treaty was pretty much reinvented as the Lisbon Treaty. And what all these treaties did was effectively to set a new set of constitutional rules for the, the European Union that couldn't actually be contested within a member state's democratic politics. And that meant that if a new government came in, or if and when a new government came into power after the treaty had been ratified and they didn't agree with what the previous government had agreed as part of the EU treaty, there was absolutely nothing that could be done about it because it would require all the member states' consent to change a treaty. So if you had quite a number of treaties in a short space of time and you were covering some 
pretty complex areas with some pretty complex rules, that's quite a lot of policy areas. They're being removed from the contest of democratic politics within any single member state. And now, in one sense, you can make that work if there is quite a lot of consensus between the citizens and between the political parties within any member state about what these new constitutional rules are. But increasingly, you could see that that wasn't the case. And you could see it actually right from the beginning in what happened in France and with Monetary Union, where they did actually have a, a referendum to legitimate the Maastricht Treaty. It wasn't President Mitterrand's initial intention, but he did call a, a referendum in for the September of um, 1992. And France's consent to um, the Maastricht Treaty and with it Monetary Union passed by a very, very small margin. So there was consent, but there was also pretty clear evidence of division and dissensus about that. And I think that what happens through like the 90s and the 2000s is just kind of like the wear and tear of that basic dynamic of there being ever more constitutional rules, significantly smaller space for democratic political contest, particularly in a number of economic policy areas and with particular pertinence, I think, in the end for Britain, migration within the European Union itself, so the free movement of labour within the, the European Union, it became increasingly hard for democracies to function, or at least some of the EU's democracies to function, whilst keeping those issues that were written into the constitutional treaties, sorry, written into the treaties, out. And I think that that dynamic is quite an important part of the Brexit story. All right. So, Helen, I'm going to move the second part of this conversation onto the premium feed. I want to tell you and our listeners where my mind is at and what I want to cover in the second half of our conversation. And let's take it from the very end, from what you were just talking about, because I think this interplay between democracy and nationalism is very important. And nationalism is a form of identity that exists around some very basic territorial claims. And the this, again, directly ties into the conversations we had going back to the 1970s around labor and capital and this uh, the growth of this sort of international class that in part operated from a place of capital flows and the attempt to craft policy in a technocratic way that maybe was able to work during a period of time where energy was more abundant, capital was more abundant, and Western democracies were able to trade some level of governance and trade away some level of individual autonomy and democratic autonomy for higher quality of living. Interestingly enough, this is a, a bargain that the Chinese Communist Party has made as well in a, in a different way. So that's something that I'm interested in. I'm very much interested, again, in the context of democratic politics to talk about 2024, because 2024 in the United States is so is going to be so crucial, in my view, for the direction of the rules-based liberal order, the Western alliance, the viability of any existing strategy that's currently being developed for how to deal with the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and this larger strategic pivot towards Asia. Ukraine, obviously, we're going to talk about this. There's no need to kind of give an explanation for it. Also, as part of all of this, talking about the US dollar system, I think is crucial. There's no way not to talk about it. It's central to this question and the future of the European Union. These are kind of the, the areas that I'm, I'm focused on. For anyone new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of today's conversation with Helen, as well as the episode transcripts and intelligence reports, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library, where you can also become a premium subscriber today. Helen, stick around. We're going to move the second half of our conversation onto the premium feed. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, 
resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.